I ain't gonna lie, I used to DJ though. Yeah. The MC was the, the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. So when I did Wuha, I was scared to death of going solo. I wanted to make fun of Diddy on the song. Don't stop. Can't stop. <laughs> we was mocking Diddy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Roundup with Shaheen Reed. That's me. And today, I just happen to have somebody who is not just a good friend of mine. This man is my brother, man. He's also one of my favorite artists of any genre, the legendary Busta Rhymes. Oh, what up, bro? <laughs> I'm here, man. You know, th thank you for coming by. I wanted to hit you. I know you was probably in the lab when the damn Argo won, because we just watched that. Just watched it. I ain't never book. seen it. Sha put me onto the joint, and when we went on this tour bus run, you know, you riding on a bus for hours with nothing to do, it's either you writing a million bars till your hand can't write, you know what I'm saying, or you watching films until you fall asleep. That's a perfect segue, because we have these quick fire questions, man, and you give me like a one or two word yeah. answer, but it's, it's a good thing that you talked, up, talked about movies, because the first question is, what's your favorite movie of all time? The Eddie Murphy Delirious shit. Okay. What's the first album that you ever bought with your own money? Run DMC first album. Wow. That's interesting. The first one I bought was Raising Hell. What? Yeah, but I was too young to say the word hell. <laughs> 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 What's a song that you are not associated with that you still know word for word? Egg B for president. Yeah, man. What's your favorite word in any language? I love saying fuck that. I love saying that. <laughs> that should just mean I mean it. Like, I'm gonna go out there and body niggas. Fuck that. Yo, you should have seen this shit happen today. Word, that shit was crazy. Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? I just love, I, I'm, I love the curse. Biggest influence on your early life? My mom's. We, we gotta tell the people this. I just love the stories of how intricate she was with your first record deal. Yeah, like, that's mom. amazing. Yeah, my mom's, she's always been the, the, the crown throne holder of the bloodline. Like, when I got the deal with Leaders in 86, we went and made this little two-song demo tape, and we would just run around and perform them two songs. The buzz started to circulate about Leaders, and then when the deal came, I was 17. So I couldn't sign my shit. My mom's <laughs> came through and said, don't worry, it's starting. Me, I go sign it for you. <laughs> uh, like, oh shit. What the hell was it like being a teenager in high school and having like one of the hottest records? That shit was out. amazing, homie, because we ain't no overhead. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You still living in your mom's crib. So everything was just good. It was no bills. The only bill you had was your cell phone and whatever you was blowing your money on. Weed and clothes. It was fun, and, and, and I think that's part of the reason why a lot of the shit that was happening back then was so creative, because a lot of us was young, and we, we didn't really have the stipulations and the rules of the, pol the politics of the industry to worry about. You know what I'm saying? You put your records out, if them shits didn't do well, you didn't give a fuck, because you didn't have to upkeep an overhead every 30 days. The respect is what you wanted to command more than anything else, and once you commanded the respect, everything else pretty much spun off of that, you feel me? Dudes now gotta get their BDS spins up to a certain number yeah. before they could command any respect out here. But the fortunate thing is the internet kind of changed that. Now dudes getting their buzz up on the internet and in the street and these labels is picking up on that after now. Right. Because the era of developing an artist is dead. Your career is 20 years, or well, 22 years now, but when did you feel like, all right, I made it? I think when I did Put Your Hands With My Eyes Could See, I knew I wasn't going nowhere. Wow. Because, because when I did Wuha, I was scared to death of going solo. That's when the feature shit became primary for me. Flavor in your ear, scenario. So I just started jumping on nigga shit because I knew that I could go in a studio with a brown bag of that chocolate tie from Gates <laughs> in Brownsville, hit to the lab, Make sure my shit was steaming before I walked in anybody's session random. And niggas want to smoke. 
And at the time, I got my little rep up already from the leader shit. So if I walked in the room, my weed burning, smell right, nigga won't take two pull off my weed. Cool, smoke. While you smoking, I'm gonna write the verse to your beat. And by the time that shit circle back, niggas is enjoying the weed so much, I gotta roll another one. So I'm taking my time writing the verse. Then I start doing my antics in the corner. Nigga won't hear what I'm doing. Turn the mic on. <laughs> I'm not spitting my shit to you over here. Let me get in the booth. So when I get in the booth and I black out and I do the shit that was the, the hot thing in the market at the time, which was the, the Dungeon Dragon growl, we, had to, we done played it five, six times in the studio. Nigga can't hear his record without the verse no more. Absolutely. So then I just break out the next day and tell a lawyer, go call that nigga lawyer. <laughs> I want a little 10 grand for that. I want a little 12 grand for that. I want a little 7,500 for that. Four or five of them shits a week, I was bathing in a lot of bags of money. It was coming in so nicely at the time that from 93 to 96, I wasn't trying to make a solo album. Wow. I just was on my feature shit. And then when we broke up as leaders of the new school officially on MTV with the Fab Five Freddy interview, out of all four of us, you know, the label decided to pick up on a solo deal for Busta Rhymes option that they had in the contract. I said, I ain't asking for no solo deal, nigga. Dante Ross said, well, how about a quarter million dollars that you ain't got to split up four ways? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I called my moms. Yo, moms, remember that deal you signed for me? We had to split up a lot less four ways. I got a whole lot more one way. She said, well, you need me to sign again? <laughs> it's like, no, nah, I'm grown now, man. And wasn't uh, Tip and Puff, didn't they give you some advice or put your hands where my eyes can see? Yeah, that's how come I did the first calm voice record in my whole career. <laughs> we was listening to some music and I had the beat. And I played the beat and they lost their mind over the beat. Diddy and Tip was like, Yo, you need to calm down on these records, man, because bitches don't want to row, row with you on every record. <laughs> chicks don't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? You got to do some chicks, that, some shit that the chicks want to do. I wanted to make fun of Diddy on the song while I was doing my calm shit. That's why if you listen on the Put Your Hands With My Eyes Can See record, you hear 9-7. <laughs> Hot shit. <laughs> Check it out. All of that was that, don't stop, can't stop. We was mocking Diddy. One of the most amazing things that, uh, that I found out with you, you know, during like this past year in the studio is just the knowledge of music. Like when you listen to a Busta Rhymes album, Bust, he really just has just so much music in his brain. Like I never really been around anybody that you know, can go from mainstream, what's popping right now on the street, hip hop, to like some really obscure soul or some really obscure reggae that I never even heard. Like you really could have been a DJ <laughs> if you wasn't, if you wasn't rapping. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, I used to DJ though. Yeah? Yeah, but I, I, you know, I kinda, I was, it was a quick in and out for me because the MC was the, the breadwinner. So I quickly de developed being an MC because I, I wanted to win that bread. But I definitely get busy with them one and twos though. <laughs> like how tough is it to be garnered as one of the greatest performers? Cause like even when we just an NBA All-Star, we went to Kenny Smith joint just to chill and, but she gotta get on the mic. <laughs> It's always a, a blessing, bro. But, you know, the frustrating part is that, you know, if you don't do it, then sometimes you come across as if you're acting like you're too cool or mm -hmm. you want some stuck-up shit. And that ain't the case, you know, at the end of the day. You niggas need to be compensated for their time, homie. Slide that bag, nigga. Like, we ain't <laughs> got to get into too much back and forth. Or we don't need to have any discrepancies whatsoever. Talk to my man, work out the fee, slide the bag through. But, you know, for friends, you show the love. If you're in a good mood or if you, the, the, the moment feels right, you just you do it. Because sometimes it, it comes back ten times full anyway. It's just good to see artists that love their shit and love the music embellish in a moment. Yeah. That's what I love about performing the most. Because sometimes right before the show, you could, you could be going through something. And the minute you get on that stage, bro, 
and them people give you that energy that supersedes what you even expected them to give you, and that excitement is at an all-time high, it kind of, you, you get lost in that shit. It's almost like it don't matter how tired you was, you forget the exhaustion you was experiencing before you get up there. For me, it's, I start feeling like I'm, 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 I'm about to short circuit or some shit because I, my energy grow when the people is wilding and showing their appreciation. You know what I'm saying? To the point where I feel like a health risk is about to happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like there's been moments where, where I've caught a chest pain spazzing so much that I tell them, yo, go get a doctor just in case. Cause something don't feel right. right. And then when shit get cool again, I go back out there and black out again. Like that shit ain't just happen. What's your favorite tour that you've been on? My favorite tour that I've ever been on, I would have to say is No Way Out tour and one of the Smoke and Groove tours. Wow. I think Smoke and Groove tour, it was me, Nas, Fuji's, Tribe, P.E., and Black Eyed Peas was on there before they shit was popping. They was actually the opening act. And you just were seeing them dancing like wild Mexican beans jumping around the place on stage. Like, But the shit that would make that moment exciting, even though nobody was in the seats, was that if you was spazzing up there, you start seeing motherfuckers running to their seat. You know what I'm saying? No Way Out tour, Jay-Z was opening up for Foxy Brown and me and then Diddy. You know, Hove kind of came into this game obviously as his own boss because they had got the Rockefeller thing popping off and did their distribution deal, you know, with Def Jam. So, you know, he came out with the t-shirt and Dame Dash with the jeans and the bulletproof vest like how 50 and them was doing it way before Fifth and them was doing it. But I think by like the fourth or the fifth show, Ho was like, man, fuck that, man. I ain't coming out here opening up for none of these niggas. And he left the door. <laughs> oh, man. Next time we've seen Ho, any shit was popping. Hard knock life. Yeah. Five million scan, and that nigga wasn't opening up for nobody no more. <laughs> when, you, when you look at that class, man, and you know, it's not too many people that's left really killing it that was out in 91, and that's out right now in 2013. Yeah, man. it's really only like four. Well, the 10 year and better dudes, it's really like about four or five of us. Yeah. But from 91, it's really about three of us. It's just me, Nas, and Hove. That's it. Nas is 93, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like 93, 94. Hove was from. Not his official solo career was 96, but Hove been rocking yeah. from like 86. Just Blaze showed the shit to me about a year or two ago. There's a record with Hove from 86. I think it's him and Jazzo or him and somebody else. This shit is like 12 minutes long, one song. They just was rhyming. <laughs> just rhymes and beat and just rhymes. It's 12 minutes. And I think Just found it at a record beat convention or somewhere he found it, some vintage record spot. And I didn't even know Hov had put out a record that long ago. It's, it's funny, man, for the people who don't know, me and Bus, we've been spending a lot of time in the studio, like the past like seven, eight months, I've been kicking it. Yeah, it's Super Bob, Bowl. This, this feel real <laughs> bugged, I ain't even gonna lie. We on the bus, we rocking out, we eating food, we sleeping, we wake up, we talking shit. And the thing that was bugging me out was just how comfortable we ended up getting around each other. You know, Sha, out of everybody, Sha be on the bus with no socks on, no, <laughs> no sneakers. <laughs> if a nigga foot don't look prettier than a woman foot, conceal your shit, playboy. But Sha shit is, this shit fly though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so I'm like, all right, this is brotherhood to the fullest because even I got a brother and I ain't barefooting around him neither. <laughs> so in the future, which I say is the immediate future, we got this album coming out, man. And it's been four years of making a masterpiece. This is, this is what Michael Jackson did. I wanted to make a climate shifter album. I wanted to make an album that was gonna change the climate of music. Like, I wanna reintroduce the boom bap in a new way. You know what I'm saying? And Primo production, Large Professor production, Q-tip production, that's the shit that I was bred on. That's the shit that I was groomed on. Eric Vietnam Sadler production, 
that bomb squad shit. I was groomed on that. So I always come back to that. And now is the time frame where it seemed like not only is it being embraced, but it's that shit that is really creating the shift to the climate again. So I just think it's refreshing, it's inspiring, it's exciting, but I personally feel that this is the best album that I've ever made in my life. And this is one of the most happiest recording processes that I've ever had in my life. Yeah, and a few people, a few people have heard it. Like, you know, some some of the tops of the tops have heard a few things. You Absolutely. know, not the entire body of work, of right. course, but they've heard some records and, you know. The you general know. consensus is definitely speaking in volumes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just got a couple of questions from the audience before we wrap up. I guess my main question is, what do you... What was your reaction to everybody's, um, like the internet just going nuts over that Chris Brown verse, man? Like, you have a lot of stellar verses that have been recited by a lot of fans, a lot of people love, but that thing just, like, what were you feeling about all the people doing the YouTube videos and the, the reenactments and the karaoke type thing? Like, what I ain't gonna doing? lie, I owe, first of all, if, 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 any time you get acknowledged for, you know, what you do, Ain't no feeling greater than that, especially at the magnitude that that shit did. Right. You know what I'm saying? But I owe that to Angie Martinez because she started that old shit. You yeah. know, once she, once Angie did the shit on the yeah, on High 97 on the on the on the on the YouTube and threw that up with with Enough and Mr. C and all of them, it it just was a chain reaction and a domino effect. And I think what really did it is that to see the first person visually kill it be a female it resonated in a whole nother way because number one, it's not one of the easiest verses to do, period. <laughs> but then it's, it's, it's a whole nother thing for a dude's ego and for other chicks' ego to know that somebody who don't even register as a MC is killing it while she busting open <laughs> duck sauce wrappers and eating dressing Chinese food and, and like this shit ain't nothing. So so the, the ambiance of all of that is 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 I think what really turned it into a phenomenon. You know what I'm saying? What inspired that verse to happen? You know I got my kids in the crib and you know when they in the crib and they talking about their favorite or their top five. And I'm sitting right there, and I ain't in the top five. You know, I'm a competitive motherfucker. So all them dudes y'all thought was y'all favorite, I'm going to go and just attack their records real quick. Right. Spank on them, and then we going to hear y'all revisit this conversation. <laughs> Earlier you mentioned yourself, Nas, and Jay as like the trifecta of those who are still around and still doing it big after 10 years. If you could predict from those artists who are out now. Right. Which three would you pick as the trifecta? Not dissing anybody else. I'm mm -hmm. just saying, you know, those are those just happen to be the three that you mentioned. But could you pick a trifecta now who you would you would say would be still relevant and still doing it strong th ten, ten years, years from, from now? now? That's a good question. That's an amazing question. I would have to say, as far as the newest of the new, Kendrick, Drake, maybe J. Cole, and. I might find it strange, but I'm a big Tyler the Creator fan. And when you see what this dude has done with the whole Odd Future brand without radio and without mainstream support, the pop-up shops, the touring, the fucking books, the Frank Ocean reinvention, you looking at Tyler the Creator just sitting there laughing at niggas like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like he, he getting the last laugh on some real quiet shit. They got the fucking Loiter Squad second season popping off on Adult Swim. It's like he got a lot of shit moving and shaking. But even with all of that, he don't compromise his ability to spit. Because when he get on them records, he's spanking all of them dudes he rocking with. You know what I'm saying? Whether you agree with what he's talking about or not, the boy get busy. <laughs> or, you got one last one? My question kind of relates to what you were just talking about, which is you're talking about artists that's been around for a while. Years ago, you mentioned the clamp. I mean, you know, the whole combination of the consciousness, the lyrics. Concept, lyrics, attitude, attitude, appearance, music, and performance. Exactly. So, I mean, my question is, do you feel like in order to stay around for a while, you have to really uh, perfect or, or give attention to those aspects of your persona as an artist? Or, I mean, are there other aspects that 
you think uh, should be you know, given attention to or shouldn't be neglected? It depends on what you involve yourself with, but those are definitely like the Ten Commandments. I ain't gonna lie, I used to DJ though. Yeah? The MC was the, the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. When I did Wuha, I was scared to death of going solo. I wanted to make fun of Diddy on the song, Don't Stop, Can't Stop. We was mocking Diddy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Roundup with Shaheen Reed. That's me. And today, I just happen to have somebody who is not just a good friend of mine. This man is my brother, man. He's also one of my favorite artists of any genre, the legendary Busta Rhymes. Oh, what up, bro? <laughs> I'm here, man. You know, th thank you for coming by. I wanted to hit you. I know you was probably in the lab when the damn Argo won, because we just watched that. Just watched it. I ain't never bus. seen it. Shaw put me onto the joint. And when we went on this tour bus run, you know, you riding on a bus for hours with nothing to do. It's either you writing a million bars till your hand can't write. You know what I'm saying? Or in your early life. My mom's. We, we got to tell the people this. I just love the stories of how intricate she was with your first record deal. Yeah, like, that's mom. amazing. Yeah, my mom's, she's always been the, the, the crown throne holder of the bloodline. Like, when I got the deal with Leaders in 86, we went and made this little two-song demo tape, and we would just run around and perform them two songs. The buzz started to circulate about Leaders or you watching films until you fall asleep. That's a perfect segue because we have these quick fire questions, man. And you give me like a one or two word yeah. answer, but it's, it's a good thing that you talked, uh, talked about movies because the first question is, what's your favorite movie of all time? The Eddie Murphy Delirious shit. Okay. What's the first album that you ever bought with your own money? Run DMC first album. Wow, that's interesting. The first one I bought was Raising Hell. What? Yeah, but I was too young to say the word hell. <laughs> <laughs> What's a song that you are not associated with that you still know word for word? Egg B for president. Yeah, man. What's your favorite word in any language? I love saying fuck that. I love saying that. <laughs> that should just mean I mean it. Like, I'm gonna go out there and body niggas, fuck that. <laughs> Yo, you should have seen this shit happen today. Word, that shit was crazy. Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? I just love, I, I love the curse. Biggest influence 